Well, understanding and compassion are the topics for today. And I would like to start by saying the world is filled with understanding and compassion. It's filled with it. Here it is. See, here I am. And there are all these people for whom I have compassion and understanding. And here you are. And here somebody else is. And somebody else is. And somebody else is. And somebody else is. The world is filled with understanding and compassion in little bitty circles. If the world is going to get any better, somebody is going to have to make a bigger circle. My contention and what I will be sharing with you this morning is this. In order to have an increase in our ability to understand and to have compassion, <clears throat> we need to manage our own inner world better. Okay? You're not getting that. You're going to tell us how. Okay. And I'll start with a story. It's a good story, but it's a lie. <laughs> I was standing out in front talking to Father Jerry when people were starting to gather. And as we're standing there talking, some guy comes up and bumps right into me and steps on my foot. Not my toe, my foot. Oh, geez. Yeah. I'm more than annoyed. And I say, watch where you're going. And then I noticed the white cane and the dark glasses. What's the point? The way we work internally, our inner world, is we experience or perceive something with our senses. We hear, we see, we feel with our hands or fingers, we taste, or we smell. That's the only way anything can get inside of us, is through our senses. Okay? So, I feel my foot. And when I perceive something, it seems like it's automatic that after I perceive something, I feel something. I feel annoyed. And so that seems, and we'll often say that, that made me do something. I felt my foot, I felt annoyed, and I said, watch where you're going. It's automatic. It's so automatic, or it's not automatic, it's so spontaneous that it seems automatic. But then I see the white cane and the glasses. My foot feels the same. But now, I feel embarrassed, and I say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you coming. And then Father Jerry says, oh, no, don't be fooled. That guy just hangs around here and does that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> My foot feels the same, and I blacken in one of those eyes. That's a lie, but isn't it a good story? Mm -hmm. okay. So what's my point? I need to understand how I work internally if I am going to ever be able to extend understanding and compassion beyond my comfortable little circle. But it's true. The world is filled with understanding and compassion but it doesn't reach out far enough.
That's my belief. So, what happens between, obviously something happens between what I perceive and what I feel. So, I have to interpret. Something intervenes. I interpret what I perceive. So the first time I interpret what I experience on the basis of an assumption. Someone steps on my foot, I assume he's being at very least careless. So I interpret what I feel by means of an assumption. I also can interpret on the mean by simply opinion, just an opinion. I, this is this. It's an opinion. I can interpret by means of an attitude that's already inside of me. An attitude is a decision I've made about the way life or some part of life is, ought to be. And it's inside of me before I experience anything. I have an attitude toward the service departments of automobile <laughs> dealerships. Justified. Mm -hmm. I've seen it justified. I used to drive a 73 Subaru. Oh, it was a lovely car. Her name was Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> and we were together for over 100,000 miles. But one day I noticed that the turn signal was not working. You know, I would. So I went, I called the dealer, I went up and took the car and he said, well, you know, that's electrical, that could take quite a while to figure out what that is and, you know, the labor costs and everything. And in Michigan, in those days at least, you had to sign a thing, can't go over a certain amount. Okay, $200. Okay, $200. He said, we'll probably have to replace that whole mechanism on the steering column. Okay, well, while you're at it, the left front running light also doesn't work. Would you check that? He said, well, you know, we can do it within the range that you've given us. Well, mid-afternoon, I get a call. Caroline is ready to be released from the hospital. They did indeed remove her mechanism from the steering column, and they said, well, we never, we worked on getting the running light fixed, but, um, you know, labor time gone up, and we had to stop. Okay. And, you know, they were so wonderfully accurate, it was $198. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Another Capuchin had a car just like mine, except it wasn't as beautiful. Mine was a beautiful yellow. His was sort of a baby green. <laughs> and I asked him if he had any trouble with his uh, turn signals. He said, yes. And I said, well, what did it cost you to get it fixed? He said, oh, about a nickel and 10 minutes of my time. So we were standing next to his car, so he showed me. Here's the little lever, and on top of it is a little screw that holds down a little wire that goes over to the mechanism where there's another little screw that holds it there. And after it, you do that often enough, the wire broke. He soldered it together. <laughs> Sometime later, don't take this wrong, I was doing some body work on Caroline on the right or left front fender and I happened to reach under, and there was a wire dangling there, which I put on the little nub, and it worked perfectly. I have an attitude, a decision I have made about the way the service departments of automobile dealerships are. They're out to rip you off. So, when I was traveling, I was in Mishawaka, Indiana, and I parked the car outside my friend's house, in the morning when I backed out, there was liquid underneath the engine. <sighs> of 
call the dealer. Yes, they can take me. Yes, I drove over. And this garage door goes clunk, 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 clunk. Just drive right in. I felt like I was entering a lion's mouth. You know, the, He's going to chew me up and spit me out. Everything except my wallet will be gone. <laughs> So there's this really nice lady, young woman, sitting there at this podium, said, how can we help you? And I said, well, did you ever consider suicide? <laughs> no, I did not say that, but I thought that. I told her what was the matter, and she said, well, just pull the car into the bay right ahead of you, and we'll take a look at it, and then you go into the lounge over there and have a cup of coffee. I said, it's going to be the most expensive cup of coffee I ever drink. <laughs> So I'm sitting there reading the pictures in the book, or the magazines, and she comes in and says, oh, I'm sorry. I said, oh, here it comes. Well, we forgot to ask you, but no, there's nothing wrong with your head gasket. Whoever changed your oil last time, when they took the oil filter off, the little what's washer stuck to the block, and so the new filter had its own washer, and so it was a little give there, and so when the pressure went up, it would push out some oil, which would run along the bottom of your oil pan, and then when you stop, it would drip. Now, you didn't need to know all that, did you? But there's a point to this. She said, we forgot to ask you ahead of time, but we changed the oil filter, and of course, in doing that, we had to change the oil but since we didn't clear that with you ahead of time, there will be no charge. Oh, come on. <laughs> Isn't this the service department of an automobile dealership? And there's no charge. Well, the only thing that can change an attitude is a new experience. So, at least now, I'm ambivalent, you know, which is terribly important because I will never know which one <laughs> to which I should assent. And I ain't going to scream at him anymore in my mind. That makes sense? Yes. Okay, then I'll go on. Um, that, I can't read that. How else can I interpret things? Well, sometimes by a bias. I just like my yellow car more than I like Dave's green car. It's just a bias. I prefer one thing over another, nothing, nothing to it. And I can interpret things on the basis of a preoccupation, just something that's stuck in my head, and all you have to do is push that button, and man, there, there it is. I did, I, we had a friar who was, what do you call this, lengthwise, he was short. Vertically challenged. Yeah. Vertically challenged. And uh, we were sitting in the living room and I wanted to go up to my room for something and I said, uh, hey, don't go, don't go to bed guys, I'll be back shortly. And he looks at me and said, what is that, a tall person's joke? <laughs> now, I'm making an assumption that he is preoccupied with the issue of his height. I'm making an assumption. Okay, so what's the point? When I do perceive something, something comes into me through the senses, it has no meaning to me until I interpret it. So I look down and I see this long, thin, brown thing next to my foot, and it has no meaning until I interpret it. I say, it's a stick. Or if I interpret it, that would be an opinion, this is this. It's, oh, it's a snake. Oh. Then it's got meaning, but otherwise it's just long thing, thin brown thing down there next to my foot. Okay? So I need, I think, this is my, my bias. This is my 
preoccupation. This is my opinion that I need to manage my inner world or I'm going to make an awful lot of mistakes in relating to other people and therefore I will be less able to have toward them understanding and compassion. Okay? So once I've interpreted something, I've, I feel something. You step on my foot, I interpret it as impolite, at least. I feel annoyed. And I can express to myself and to the world whatever feeling I have by saying, I feel annoyed, or I feel like I've been taken advantage of. It's a metaphor. Or I can say, I feel like I'd like to punch you in the face. <laughs> An action that I saw. A label, a metaphor, or an action. I can express how I feel in those three ways. Okay? My feelings do not lead automatically to my behavior. Because, as the examples show, I do make a decision between what I feel and how I behave. I get to decide. It can, as I say, be so spontaneous that it feels automatic, but in fact, I get to decide. So my, for me, my, I think, my inner world looks like this. Okay, what does that have to do with understanding and compassion? Well, I think understanding is related to this section, the way I interpret what I perceive. And as I said, I think all of us, all people, have a circle of friends, acquaintances, whatever, for whom they can feel some understanding. Oh, yeah. And they can reach the point where I say, oh, yeah, and I can let those people get away with murder. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to understand. OK, OK. It's wonderful. And I think compassion is a decision. I decide how I will behave toward you. And my suggestion is that our faith invites us to make some decisions. Okay? I mean, Jesus said things like, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but what I say to you is offer no resistance to the one who is evil. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other one to him as well. Stop judging that you may not be judged. Now, you can't stop judging. That's the way we're built. But what that means is don't, don't judge the way a judge judges. A judge can condemn. So that's what that one means. Do to others whatever you would have them do to you. 
And then Peter says, well, how many times do I have to forgive that SOB? He didn't say it that way. <laughs> seven times? And Jesus said, no, 70 times. Whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. You know, but we lucked out with a pope who, went, who lives by that. Oh, that's an opinion of mine. <laughs> Whoever wishes to be first among you must be the slave of all. Forgive so that you may be forgiven. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the great granddaddy of all understanding and compassion is, Father, forgive them. Compassion. Understanding, because they know not what they are doing. We all have our little circle in which we have compassion and understanding. But until we broaden that, we will not get out of what we're currently in, whether you consider it great or a mess. We're not going to change. What might bring about change, I think, my opinion, <laughs> is if we all watch our assumptions. Because, here is, take this one sentence home with you and forget all the rest. I never know what someone else intends unless they tell me. When every time I talk about what motivates or has motivated somebody else's behavior, I am out of touch with reality because all I am in touch with is my assumption. And now that, to me, is the most important thing <laughs> that anybody could take away from today. I never, I never, how often? Never know what motivates another person unless that person tells me. Oh, yeah, I could tell that he was. Oh, yeah, I could tell that she. No, I Never. Okay, sad story. I used to be on the faculty at St. Lawrence Seminary High School. Actually, I was the president. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody ever noticed that, which was good. We had a student, a senior, who was a shoe-in for the Outstanding Student of the Year Award. He just was. And he just was. I'm happy to say they've changed that now. They now give Outstanding Students Awards. I think that's much better. Anyway, that's my opinion. <laughs> um, OK, and we're at the faculty meeting, and we're going to vote on the Outstanding Students. And one of the teachers, uh, stands up and says, no, I think he's gotten selfish in his senior year because he didn't go out for forensics this year. He was, the previous three years, the star of the forensics program. The faculty member who made this assumption about the motivation of this student changed the opinion of this student in the minds of every faculty member. Mm -hmm. The man is alive today only because I am not allowed to carry a firearm. <laughs> I 
I was that student's spiritual director. Mm -hmm. I know why he did not go out for forensics. That was probably at that point of his life the most difficult and generous decision, selfless decision, that he had ever made. Mm. I know, but because I knew it from spiritual direction, I did not feel like I could disclose that. Mm -hmm. But to this day, I regret that I didn't go to the telephone on the wall, page that student, and ask him if I could disclose what he had told me. To this day, I live with this regret. But to me, that is one of the most egregious examples of somebody actually thinking that he knew what motivated another person to act. I never know. I need to interpret what I perceive of the other person's behavior. I can't help it. It's, it's, I have to. I, and if I interpret on the basis of an assumption about what motivates that person, I need immediately to conjure up another assumption about what the, re what the motive might be. Now I have two assumptions. I cannot assent to either. So what must I do? I'm going to shock you. I must keep my damn mouth shut. More, it's my opinion. <laughs> I'm sharing with lot. I'm sharing lots of opinions with you. It is my opinion that most of the lack of understanding and lack of compassion in our world is that we attribute motives to people on the basis of assumptions. You know, if 20 people decided they're never again going to act on an assumption about somebody else's motives or intentions, the world would be better. Mm -hmm. I will still make assumptions. I can't help but make assumptions. But I don't have to act on those assumptions. How do I keep from acting on an assumption? I propose to myself, another assumption about what might have motivated. And then I'm not going to know, and so I will not say to somebody else what motivated this person. When I'm making assumptions, I don't know anything about another person. I only know about myself. Does that make sense to you? I wish I could remember the example precisely. But I did something that was just, it was to my own benefit. And I can't remember what it was. And one of my brothers came up to me afterwards and just praised me to heaven about how generous I had been in doing what I did. That's not what motivated me. But that person was sure he noted, knew what motivated me. And he probably, or he might have, gone off and told others, what a wonderful person I am. And he'd be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, sort of a truism. Um, the mistakes I make about myself become the lies I tell others. I don't intend to lie, but I'm telling them something that's not true. So when I say what I took off on you, I don't think it's ever true to say I can't or I must. I think it's always I want to or I don't want to. But when I say I can't, I've just surrendered all of my autonomy. I'm forced 
to do this. Now, I can be forced to do things, but I'm talking about when I just say, I can't. I have, I have tried to train myself to say, I don't want to. It's a decision I make. I want or not. I don't have to. And when I say I can't, if it's talking about lifting a building, then I can say I can't. It's physically impossible. But to say I can't go with you because I have to do my homework. Well, no, I don't want to go with you because I want to do my homework. It's a small thing, but remember, the whole point that I'm trying to make with you is if I'm going to be able to have compassion and understanding for others, I need to learn how to manage my inner world. <laughs> That's the whole point of this. That's the whole point. There are two kinds of behaviors that I know of. There's, I call them, behaviors which are an investment. And there are behaviors, now, I, how old am I? I remember the bargain basements. <laughs> I used to work for Marshall Fields in Chicago. Well, actually, it was their store in Skokie. But we had a bargain basement. Well, I always thought I was getting the same merchandise that I would have paid twice as much for if I had bought it upstairs. But I quickly found out that, no, it was an inferior product that I was selling in the bargain basement. Well, that's the way I think about behaviors. The behaviors that I decide the, that I choose can be bargain basement. So I hear the person I sit next to at the table all the time grinding his teeth. I think it's very impolite. I feel very annoyed and I decide not to say anything. It's a bargain basement behavior. Didn't cost me much but I'm going to have to buy it over and over again. <laughs> that in order to have understanding, I need to watch how I interpret things. In order to have compassion, I have to decide how I will behave. Does that make sense? Understanding, I have to monitor what goes on inside of me. Because sometimes I think I'm understanding what's outside of me, and really all I'm understanding is what's inside of me. Every time I think I know someone else's motivation, I am not understanding what's out there, I'm understanding what's inside of me. So monitoring this within me can lead me to a greater understanding of other people. Over here, again, what do I want to do? My suggestion is that Jesus gave us a whole lot of good ideas. St. Francis <coughs> said, this is the rule and life of the friar's minor. Namely, to observe the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't say know it. He said observe it. It's a decision. What do I want? 